An old man wearing tracksuit trousers leans on the frame stock of his rifle. He gathers a big ball of spit in his mouth, then spits it out into the extinguished fire before him. He raises his black eyes, hooded by creased eyelids to meet yours. Unclouded by cataracts, his eyesight is sharp. The what now? I can't hear you. I may have. All sorts of little rats have come sniffing around, trying to give up the position. The position? Sounds like a hiding place. Fire guy. Regressive bourgeoisie henchman. Can't even talk like a grown-up. My eyesight? <clears throat> yes. Helps me see all the shit. A shudder of disgust passes his left side. His right side remains motionless. I did. And you opened it. How? I should have burned that console down. The boat engine. On the water. It's not nice. It's a piece of shit. But it gets the job done. It's a Triangong 446. A Samaron rifle. How did you get hold of one? It was sent to us by our brothers in the Sinyao commune. Military aid. It has stayed true to him. He can still make it sing. You heard me. It's good now. Like chalk, white from the ball. Yes, I bet you've killed a lot of people with it. You fascist fuck. Have you come to make me one of them? His left eye twitches. With what? Fear? Rage? We have come to ask you questions. Nothing more. If you do not comply, we will take you in. Do you understand? Another spitball lands in the ashes. That's all the answer he gives. The danger levels here are hard to read. One moment he's a fire, the next a fire gone out. No. Put it down now, sir. Or you're gonna blow my brains out before you question me. To hell with it. It's a walking stick anyway. It's out of bullets. Like an amputated limb in the sand. His gaze follows your motions. The rifle feels surprisingly light in your hand. Frame stopped and patched in places with tape and wire. Still warm from his parched hands. Not the metal. The metal is ice cold. This weapon has been modified several times. The rifle's in a shabby state, like a crutch that's seen too much travel. Hieroglyphs are embossed into the forearm made of walnut. On the butt, you see Vespertine writing, burnt into the wood. Triangong, 4.46 millimeter, made in Sinyao. No one said it has to be a Belma grave. We were just guessing. From ballistics, it could easily have been a Triangong, too. It doesn't matter if it was made in Shanti Shanti. All it has to do is use jacketed ammunition. And it does. The right type and the right calibre. I wonder how old it is. The old man 
does not answer. He just stares in front of him. The old man keeps following your motion with his gaze. His right arm twitches suddenly. Some kind of involuntary response? Something is slightly off with his motorics. My name is Josef Lilianovich Dross. Political Commissar of the 114th Anti-Aircraft Division of the 4th Army of the Commune of Revachol. I am a deserter, a partisan, and a prisoner of war. This is my termless surrender. The Commune of Revachol? Do you mean the ICM? Your uh, holdover from the... From the Insul Indian Citizens Militia, the Army of the Revolution. I was recruited in Jamrock in 07, trained in the Ecole de Contrôle Orion, and consigned to emergency defense duties in 08. I left my unit on the eve of the landing. When I returned here on May 14th, the commune had fallen. Still armed and ideologically trained, I wrote a criticism of myself and resumed partisan duties. Forty-three years. No, I've been on other islands too. I was an resurrection until they turned it into a spa in 18. Then I was an E-48, a nameless sound, until the sea washed over it. Then I came back here. That was 22 years ago. 43 years and 10 months. It's not how a human being should live, <laughs> but I had to. I couldn't just forget. I couldn't just forget what I saw. What have you been doing during all this time? Hiding, fishing, waiting. Where the afternoon grows late, on Rue de saint Gislaine, people walk home. Street lights will soon be lit. Further inland, the streets are alive with workers, men, women, children. Street hawks and migrant laborers. The temperature is steady. Alto cumulus clouds form above Precinct 41. Two police officers step out of the Whirling and Rags cafeteria. Satellite officer Jean Vic Mayer inspects giant letters across the plaza mosaic in dark red government marked heavy fuel oil. Patrol officer Judith Minot points west. The fishing village. She glances at her watch. We meet in 15 minutes. It's a 10 minute walk. The officers go, leaving behind the writing. Still smelling of petroleum. One day, it says, I will return to your side. Always waiting. For her to return. Her who? Girl child. Revolution. I am not a fool. I know. The material base for an uprising has eroded. The working class has betrayed mankind. The historic opportunity for a revolution has passed. It will not come back anymore, however hard I try. Whatever I do. I was just 16 years old. 15 when I volunteered. I had a lapse of faith. <clears throat> and of courage, too. You could say I misunderstood the historic role of the proletariat and thought Mazovian socioeconomics were fallible. For a second, I doubted the irreducible laws of historic materialism. A second, 
is all it took for reaction to take hold. Petty bourgeois terror. It's in all men. It's the same thing. You haven't seen it. Not really. Not naked. It's impossible not to be afraid. And this was when? He is still not convinced of his safety. You should not be either. May the 13th, 08. Forty-four years ago. The horizon was black with coalition airships. Their petroleum rose to the sky and it looked like... like it formed the clouds. Storm clouds. When they started shelling, it was dark magic. The combined might of international capital. All at once, all the greed and terror in the world tore into Revachol. It lifted streets from the ground and turned houses into ghosts. We were in the flak tower, huddled on the floor. The artillery was 80 kilometers away in Ozon, but I knew, I knew the commune would fall. We would all be turned into ash. So I said I was going to the map room. A terrible shame, still within him. The lobes of his ears are red with it. The shame and smallness of what he became. Now, I climbed the chain link across the water and hid inland, in the bunkers there, like the weakest of the weak. A mouse, frightened at the ordinance all night and the sound of the rotors in the morning, whirring. <laughs> Airships. I climbed out into hell. The landing was complete. The chain was submerged. I had to swim back. The fortress was half submerged too. Shattered. They'd all drowned in the lower levels or got torn to shreds above. The anti-aircraft gun had malfunctioned. So had I. I left them without ideological direction. It was real. I'd seen it. I'd seen it in reality. Some kind of great terror, worse than you've ever seen. The mask of humanity fall from capital. It has to take it off to kill everyone, everything you love. All the hope and tenderness in the world. It has to take it off just for one second to do the deed. And then you see it as it strangles and beats your friends to death. The sweetest, most courageous people in the world. You see the fear and power in its eyes. Then you know that the bourgeois are not human. I had to. I had to fight it. I had to never stop. It's not an island, Dwat. It's a defensive fortification of the commune of Revachol. And I am its last surviving defender. The congenitally deformed King Philip II built it to restrict access to the Bay of Revachol. We captured it in 02, retrofitted the fort with an AA gun to defend against an airborne landing against the whole world. Coalition military called it Operation Deathblow. I later found out on the radio they called it Deathblow. You are one of them. Tell me, who speaks like that? We had 50 million people on Caillou alone. Iblis. The Black-Eyed Angel. 
How does anyone survive? I steal. Supplies, vegetables. I collect rainwater. It's the life of a dog, not a human being. <coughs> How is your health, Mr. Dross? I've been throwing up blood since winter. Red, like beetroot. Been passing it in stool, too. The RCM can provide medical services. You need to be looked over. I need to die. You don't have medical facilities. You have guns. That's all they give you. Toy guns. You also have Druamine. I have been running out of that stuff. There's no way he could manage the pain without them. It's safe to say he is addicted to painkillers by now. It's the little joys. A dark joke. A sunshiny day. Morphine. There's nothing to look over. The triage is in, and it's black. Administer morphine. Moribund. I have them. I have holes in my brain. Years missing. Others filled with pain only. A decade of... I don't even know what. Inferno? At least you know it. The traders of this city turned the lights back on in the 30s. After the fighting stopped, ruins glittering in the dark like a fucking merry-go-round. It's disgusting. It was hard in the Thames. I didn't have partisan training. They were searching for stragglers, those bloodhounds. Floodlights on the water at night. There were posters, campaigns. We communards still hoped, and they needed to snuff that hope out. The East capitulated. Martinez and Cold City were turned to dust. But Jamrock, Forberg, even Coron, and Boogie Street, of course. Those fucking kips had Marsov coursing through their veins. And others too. Some cordons of Revachol were still fighting. There were cells. I tried to contact them. Soon they all went silent. The frequencies dead. At night, I used a dinghy. I only went after dark then. When I got to the city, I stayed underground. Patrols, you lot, the commons too, they'd started snitching. In the city, you move underground? From bunker to bunker. Not anymore. No one cares now. I don't even have to hide. They think I'm another antisocial vagrant. I could walk straight into that town if I wanted. I just... I don't want to. They're all traitors. Pigs, rabbits, and dogs. Men without ideals are only animals. The propaganda bunker. <laughs> I used to, but not anymore. Propaganda bunker? They stored leaflets there. Broadcasting equipment, too. Made broadcasts, I think. Propaganda officers. I buried them with their leaflets. They killed themselves. Two young boys. A lot of our boys did. I spent some winters there. Never liked it. Kept thinking of them. No need to go underground anymore. It's better in the ruins, on the ground. I do. They're good. Plenty of tar. I like that boy on the pack, too. 
Reminds me of the last century. The old man looks across the water at the city, the ruins, the motorways rising above it. No, I am not a soldier. I am an ideological officer. I belong to the party, not the army. Trained in historical materialism, then assigned as a political commissar by the party. These things used to mean something. The old man does not answer. He tilts his silver head and looks at the reeds. You see a small tremor pass through his legs. His job was to assure the army answers to civilian control and follows the ideology of the Commune. Scientific communism! A commissaire politique is a knight philosopher of the revolution, a future human. Awakened from shutdown by the promise of ideology. He nods slowly, then another tremor. He looks away to the sea and lets out a cough. You're with the RCM, the coalition-appointed mob that enforces bourgeois morals in Revachol. You're the RCM. You represent the Moralist International, the enemies of humanity who took this city. I represent their adversary, Le Parti Communiste dans ce land. Take me to them as a prisoner of war. I have relinquished my weapon. I can no longer serve. No superiors can relieve me of my duty. You bulldoze them all to a mass grave for trying to free humanity. <coughs> A spray of blood from his mouth on the black charcoal in the fire pit. There's nothing serious in this world. It's a farce. What strikes you about this gaunt man is not the stomach pain, or the cough, or the malnutrition. For a man who spent 44 years in and in the urban world, Indeed, he speaks fluidly. His movements are rapid, if erratic. His voice, despite the cough, is there. It is capable of expressing complicated ideas. Above all, he seems animated. It's a mystery. This animation comes at a cost too. Erratic hand gestures, thought processes cut off like threads, as he just stares at the logs or the reeds. He also suffers mood swings, bubbling to the surface, unconstrained by his nervous system. You've seen demented people before. This feels similar, yet different. When his thoughts move, they are lucid, keen even, not senile. Is this some kind of substance damage? Like he's addicted to something, not only the painkillers he's clearly on. No. I won't be stuffed full of shit like the rest of this city. You said you take painkillers. I take them to cope with pain. The people of this city use painkillers because they have pain. Untreated illnesses, not enough money for a greedy doctor. It's not a downer, rather an upper, judging by his snaps like some kind of decadent rock star. No, I'm not okay. I shit blood, and I'm surrounded by insane people. There it is again. Erratic hand motions, bouts of rage, and the stomach thing too, of course. Could it be a symptom of overdosing on something? Something even you have not tried? Keep your eyes peeled. 
I've used it for killing people. Here we go. A trail of blood. The lieutenant smells it too. Killing people? It's a gun. That's what they're for. You want a moralist euphemism? Defending your family and your property. I haven't done that. I've used it to kill people. Interesting. During or after the war? There is no after the war. Class war is never over. This is it. You can feel it, like battery acid on the tip of your tongue. Something you haven't felt in a while. But this is what you live for. This is the shit. The great serotonin jackpot. Be careful now. Slow and steady does it. Make him repeat it first. Don't mess this up. Remember, he wants to tell you. Get personal. Nothing comes to you. Silence. His black eyes look at you. And in them, a chill, like electricity running up your spine, crawling into your skull. All is not as it seems. Detective. What did I just say? Oh no, you were wrong. Don't listen to your hands, for God's sake. You're too close. I don't want to tell you anything, you grotesque murderer. And why did you think that was a good idea? Don't listen to me. I'm wrong all the time. The who now? He hurt you. He just wants to hear you say it. You're in. Oh yes, that one. Ugly piece of work, that boy. Did you kill him? I am a son of a welder. And an officer of the Commune of Revachol. <laughs> I do not collaborate with murderers and pederasts of the liberal regime. A drop of blood in the saliva. The gun. The murder weapon is the perfect opener. The scent of blood in the air. But what else? There was something you can't remember. <laughs> Not a lot of guns around that use military-grade ammunition, are there? It's a real gun. Not like your little musketeer pistol. I've seen you prance around with that, jumping hoops for the liberals. You look like imbeciles. Why don't you ask them to give you real weapons? <laughs> Going against automatic rifles with these toy guns. Of course you got those boys killed. Damn, he saw you. He's watched it happen. You know what? You're right. I'm convinced this made the shot. Should we call it? Good. This feels good, doesn't it? Telling things up like this. When you have the murder weapon, you have the killer. Murder. I saw you poking around there, looking for evidence. You're damn diligent when it comes to dead fascies. Did you like the view? You had direct visibility. There are embrasures in the concrete, specifically meant for a top follower to use. And you had a long-range rifle in your possession. You have been here a long time, Mr. Dross. Too long. You need medical aid. I'm ready to die. 
<coughs> I've done my part. Because it's a sniper's nest, you stupid fuck. Radio Gosh is right. You have worms in your brain. Wait, here it comes. The goddamn Maybells. The dried Maybells on Clausia's roof. There were Maybells in the grass when you got here. They're revolutionary symbols from the war. Nowhere else, nowhere in all of Martinez have you seen them this spring. Wait, don't forget the footprints. The diagonal prints in the dust in the secret space behind Clausia's bedroom. Now, they're gonna come up. You got it. Remember, the boot prints were like no modern soul. Damn Maybells. The whole island is turning white with them. So many this year too. The spring is coming. No, it's already here. Wash the filth away. They blossom on the islet before. We fertilized them with our blood. Resurrection was snow white in May, before they ruined it. South, the Bay of Martinez is dotted with little freckles of islets, turning green, with white flowers in white snow. The coast, too, before they piled their containers on top of it, filled with broken, useless trash for fat. Fingered bourgeois children to play with. You must get around a lot to stay undetected all these years. Do you know any secret paths? Pinball workshops? I may. Class G. With the victim. There is a small tremble, looks like a smile, a crooked smile, yet isn't quite voluntary. He's about to burst. Everything is brands with you individualists. Who cares what brand my shoes are? Sansa? Some shit. Show me the souls, please, Mr. Doras. Fucking imbecile. The maker is Sensorique, the model is Corobe, and the size is 43. The size fits, but not the sole. Sire, he doesn't have to be wearing them right now. Racking those brains, are you? Desperate to report something back to your masters? They must have really loved that dead fuck. The lieutenant gives you a quick sideways glance and nods to acknowledge. The prints were his. You can see it in those eyes. He can't keep them from flickering, looking for something. The old man stares at his own prints in the ash around the fire. Silent suddenly, some strange process within him. A gush of wind. Seagulls in the distance. You know who he was. A coalition trained murderer. Armored and armed. He wasn't human. The blunt end of a hammer. Dripping with blood. Beating us to the ground. Moaning with joy. You hounds get so thorough when a company trained killer dies. I haven't seen you on this coast for 40 years. You know, maybe I should have killed one sooner. Got your attention. Now you stop beating druggies and prostitutes in your basement. Now you come to investigate. Not when they die by the hundreds. Oh, the inhumanity. One paramilitary less in Revachon. 
The lieutenant raises his right arm to hush you. Hush, he does not need to be pushed anymore. The ball is rolling. While the lieutenant listens, holding his breath. I had them in my sights, both of them, him and the whore. I was breathing with them, in phase, and I pulled the trigger and flew on the air until I landed in his mouth. I didn't think I had a shot like that in me anymore. I did. I saw him kneel there with his mouth full of death and that stupid look on his face. And his dick still in her. Nothing. I went to sleep. Next morning there were Maybells everywhere. The world was white. Or what's left of it, anyway. My last spring here. I knew the fascists would come to avenge their own. And so they did. Mr. Dross, are you aware you're confessing to murder? Yes. And you were looking at them, the victim and a young woman, having sex, through the scope of your rifle that night, before you shot him? The old man nods. Why? Because that's what they were doing. I don't understand. Do you, detective? I don't understand this part. I'm always looking. Are you always looking through the scope of a rifle? I'm just trying to understand. A rifle scope has the best magnification. Helps him see all the shit. And if you don't like it? Click. Then you pull the trigger? Yes. Think of it as a form of critique. Them. Fucking. I didn't like that. Jealousy is a reactionary concept. I didn't like the Reaver enjoying himself. Drugged out, soothed in the arms of a young woman. I wanted him to die so he could not enjoy life anymore. And I wanted to see his head explode. That too. She should know better than to hold a child murderer between her thighs. I knew he'd be there for one more second. Writhing. That's all it takes for the bullet to reach his head. Now that I think of it, I wasn't aiming for his mouth. I wanted his brains to spill out on her. But you can't have everything. The caliber of bullet he used does not do that kind of damage. Since she came to Martinez, I saw her sneaking in the reeds early in the morning behind the fell building. It was dark, still winter. She didn't have her skimpy outfit on then, just a spot in the night, moving. Past the fell building on the coast, what was she doing there? Hiding something in the water. She had a fag after she'd done it. I was up in the ruins there. She couldn't see me, but I could see her, smoking. She was nervous, but not scared. And beautiful. Her passport and ticket to Villiers. <coughs> and from there to Cachet Brou. Yes, after she'd gone. It was a submersible. Well made, actually. Sloppy, we should have gotten her to tell us about this. Did you take the documents? No, I put them back. Why would I take them? I'm not going to film. Oh, I mean... 
I did. She had a face like an archipelago with those birthmarks and a body hard and lean and bruised all over, black and yellow. I could see she's taken a beating. I could see who she was, too. A spook, on the run. Revachal's the cloaca of capital now. All the bagmen and arms dealers end up here to do drugs and have sex like animals. You could tell she was a spook from the documents? She had different color hair on the photo and glasses, forged. Some sordid bourgeois affair. I heard about this kind of thing on the radio. I'm not blind, am I? It quickly comes to you. Oh, yes. Cutting those drugs of hers into little lines with a knife. Masturbating. Everything in him fills with impossible longing, all at once. Did you make that hole? With a clip point knife. Good for listening in, too. For hearing the moaning and the snorts. Like that, too. Yes. Bending like a bow against the glass. I've been through all of Martinez, every nook and cranny. Yes, that too. The things they did in that little room, what she'd do to feel good. Funny the way light works. You turn it on inside and it gets so dark out, you can't see a man looking in. I learned that in the 20s when they were still hunting me. I've seen people do some shit, but... You hear the familiar scribble of the lieutenant's pen. A quick glance at you. One more loose end down. We're doing this, detective. How did you get in there, the hidden pinball workshop? I can just walk in there now after a good wash. I told you. They think I'm an antisocial. Closing hour is a good time. The kitchen's empty. You had to open the steel door in the kitchen? How? I got that open a long time ago. Some bourgeois gay merchant lived there. I don't know, 15 years ago? He left spare keys all over, and I took one. Then I saw her turn the light on one night in my scope. Andy found use for it, a spare key, like the one hanging behind the Union box window. There's... There's nothing to hold on to. Only this. It's, it's not enough. The coals of his eyes glisten suddenly, like stones dripping with water. Is he crying? Man needs to feel something else. In this fight, it helps if you have your eye on something there. It's weakness, I know. Yes, over the years. It's not unproletarian to feel something. No. I don't really know. I was there one night, and she was crying, like a child, in the corner of her room on the floor, like she does sometimes. The day after I killed him. Yes, I don't know why I do the things I do anymore. Maybe, I told you, I have holes in my brain now. I wouldn't just sit here waiting for you. A sudden pang of rage. If you came ten years ago, I would have killed you. In the silence, the lieutenant draws a line in his notes, then nods at you once more. One more down. 
occur. You hear a low frequency hiss, barely, beneath the audible spectrum. Then it's gone. The lieutenant nods at you in acknowledgement. That's it. Motive. We have it. Where is she, that Clasier? I haven't seen her there for days. Gone. I knew it. She kept staring into the scope this last week, at the island, like she knew. She'd look at night, crying or smoking on the roof, staring right into me. It doesn't matter. Midtown, across the Bay of Revachon, cold rain falls on 40-story towers. Above them, Lucerne Central Aerodrome, a cocoon suspended in the grey sky by a web of suspension wiring encircled by hybrid aircraft. On the platform, a young woman is withdrawing from amphetamines, barbiturates and alcohol. Yet still, she smiles among the crowd, among the great ghosts of the city she's leaving for another, far south. Smaller, distant, hidden, not like the great chandelier she sees sparkle in the night below her. Street lights, towers, tenements and water, and across it, a dark strip of ruins, barely visible, if she didn't squint her eyes. There, on a dilapidated jetty, in a nameless village, two police officers and one special consultant look across a narrow strip of sea, the ruins of a sea fort stick out of the water, built by Philippe II, reappropriated by the commune, then lost in the landing. He's there, doing what exactly I don't know. Satellite officer Vic Mayer points at the ruins. Behind that anti-aircraft something, that's why we can't see him. Special consultant Heidelstam is optimistic. We'll see the boat when he comes. Let's go get a coffee until then. I know this interesting little place. Where? His voice trails off as the three walk down the jetty. As the men go, Patrol Officer Minnow looks back over her shoulder at the crumbling fortification in the rain, like a rotten tooth rising out of the water. We could get more. We've got him talking. Tragic comedy. Druggies, prostitutes, and rentiers. A strange little engine seems to fire up in him again. It straightens his back. Specifically, the whole city is a charnel house, stripped clean and draped in neon. The Martinez. Martinez is the worst. Because of the racists. Everyone is a racist in Martinez. It's their favorite thing to do in the whole world. Listening to race-themed radio shows. In the ruins. In their lorries. Pump full of steroids and Radio Revachal 92. Race this. Race that. It's all sanctioned by that social democratic union and the farce of a social democrat who runs it. Yes, the fly larva in his container. He let some nihilistic advertising yuppies erect a statue of Philippe III, a syphilitic murderer on the town square, to spit on the working class. Not since the serfs of ancient Pericarnassus has history produced a more inert social class than the Martinez proletariat. The rest of Revachal at least pretends to rebuild. These people still live in ruins. Intense, like animals, like those boom boom morons on the ice. A pity they didn't drown in that tent of theirs. 
The worst of them is the blood-drenched Sucreong on her yacht, licking her lips. The old whore's gone now. Her gun-toting porcelain men are dead. So, actually, no. The worst is that old cock parading around in his uniform, throwing balls all day. It's not enough that the racists and liberals are dancing on our graves. The old loyalist ghouls still parade the ruins, too. Every morning he's there, while the parasites he fought to protect are off in Ozon, or Kwayamoran, or some other island they built their palaces on, feeding on drugs and having sex with their own children. That's all the rich really want. Sex with their own children. Throughout history, even the royal bloodline of the suzerain, it's all just an excuse for them to have sordid sex. At least that old cunt Frisell is now dead. We did good when we pushed him under that horse car. If only, in the thirties, those disco whores... The disco whores are too much. Hatred shuts down his brain's language center, leaving only a nonsensical sputter. And the Supriant on her yacht? Joyce? Probably. Boom Boom Morons on thin ice, going under. Those are the tent kids. Horse. Another hideous disappointment. Unions are the real enemy. The true enemy of the proletariat, placating the masses. First against the wall with them. Keep the mills running, collaborants, the whole lot. They should go before the owners. They were boom, boom, imbeciles. At least they're not there anymore. What more is there to say? They're duped by bourgeois culture. I've seen their kind pop up like worms after the rain. A Sucreon, a bloodsucker, the rich whore on our boat. Women like her feed on the life energy of young working class men, and they let her. I can't believe the inert lumpen out there. They just let her drive her little boat like that. No violence, not even a robbery. The working class has lost their appetite for justice. If only we had the ammunition. Every fucking morning for 34 years. Throwing that ball. One ball against the other. I've always loathed that game. That is not a working class game. I don't care what they say on Radio June. Royalist ghouls played like it was life itself. Click, clack across the water each day. And that uniform, like a parrot plumage. I won't even mention that he's a traitor to his race. A patank maniac race traitor. I remember him. I remember him from La Noce. Not him, personally, his make and model. There were tens of thousands of them. I thought we took them all out before the liberals came to their rescue. We missed one. That one. There doesn't seem to be a single person under the pine today. Not even Gaston. Alone. Fat and plump like a pheasant just begging to be popped off. Please, Mr. Dross, shoot me. He whispers with such predatory hunger, it borders on longing. 
Not yet. I like to look at him strut around, place the crosshair on his medals, right on his face, and just fiddle the trigger. Think about it. Let the bonbon melt in my mouth. Save the treat for later. He is a juicy bonbon, that one. A real treat to the black day. The blackest. When I put that gun in my own mouth, I think. No, don't waste it. Put this lead in that cock, Rene. For the boys he killed. And then I look at him throw those balls, and I suddenly feel... better. I even hid one bullet, so I'd always have one for him. Haven't seen him around lately, strutting around. Must be down with arthritis. I hope it hurts like hell. I hope he sweats blood. No. I waited too long. I waited too long and now he's dead? I'm sorry, Mr. Dross. I understand you knew him for a long time. They're all dead now. Fuck it. All human beings care about each other. I cared for seeing his head explode. Now, God damn this world. You think I haven't seen people die? It's all I've seen them do. Fuck and die. All the other plans we had. To love. To colonize the pale. It's all fucked. He's not okay. This is just another black day in a row of black days. Something strange is keeping him together, making him endure. Glad we talked about what? What? But you said I would be taken to the. The wind picks up. The silence on the water is broken all around you. Little shivers of waves appear. The lieutenant continues, like an incantation. Your wayfarer rights have been suspended. Information provided to the officers on the scene will be used against you by the prosecution. You will be given legal counsel within one week and must face court in 44 days. Do you understand? Do you understand? But... No, I don't want to. I have to stay here. He's sweating. Beads are forming on his forehead. Pupils are dilated too. Eyes getting blacker and blacker. Your confirmation is not required, sir. Now on to the boat. There it is again, to your north, as it has been since you came to the coast. The reeds whisper, stalks rubbing against each other, but then, in the middle of it, something completely different. It sounds like a bow, very slowly being drawn against the strings of a violin, a very small violin, made of reeds and rushes. Maybe there is room for three on the boat. What? What are you talking about? Is this... really us? Your skin crawls. delicate tangle of arms and legs unfolds from the reeds, limb by limb, to then just stand there, moving its scythe-like arms in ghostly silence. What are you talking about? 
There's nothing there. The stick insect is over three meters tall. It looks straight at you with its tiny pinprick eyes and its grotesquely small head. You feel your legs shaking under you and your gun hand rise instinctively. You feel the lieutenant's hand on your back and then you hear him say four words. I can see it. Thank God. If he can see, then you're not insane. It's really there, spinning slowly, in absolute silence, its limbs long and slender. Be very, very careful. The creature stands on long stilt-like legs antennae hanging from his head like a woman's hair, white and curled at the tips. It is no more than five steps away from you. Reed-like tufts stick out of its joints. As the insect moves its forearms, it produces a faint hiss, like a reel-to-reel -reel machine spinning after the tape breaks. The hiss is different from the strings you heard before. It says something else in a lower pitch. I have absolutely no idea. You glance over your shoulder. The lieutenant holds a piece of milled aluminium. He begins to pull it open extremely carefully. It's the camera. No! The flash will scare the creature off. Warn him now. We need a photo. No one will believe us. From the corner of your eye, you see a sudden cascade of motion ripple through the insect's limbs. A series of ultrasonic clicks fills your ear. I am not palatable. Do not eat me. I am afraid. I won't be one of those fools who didn't take a picture. You see the insect turn to him. Its mandible antennae reaching out. Its motions are quick, sudden. Understood, of course. The spindly mechanism turns itself back to you. Its antennae taking their measure of the air, slowly. Nothing changes in the cyclical brain motion of the creature's limbs. They are porcelain white on the inside and reed colored on the out. Beige, light brown and striped. You are unsure if it is scared or not. Slowly, with your breath held, you take two small steps toward the phasmid. The creature lets out a series of ultrasonic clicks that swarm around your head like swallows. Hissing and clicking, it extends its mandible-like antennae to greet you. You're right below it now, looking up at the colossal chitin of its white limbs. The head of the creature is crowned by reeds, and its eyes are like small droplets of water. No reply. A total ancient silence comes from its mouth, along with what appears to be some kind of foam. The stridulations of its limbs continue all around you. The invertebrate stops, raising its scythe-like arms and tilting its tiny head, formed from the fused plates around its mouth. For a second, the effigy is frozen. Then it nudges back into motion with a click. The insect stops its stridulation, seeming to observe you. Below its crown of reeds, little pinprick eyes detect motion, glittering. The world stands still around you. Suddenly, there is silence. No, stop. 
be afraid. The invertebrate comes back to life, stridulating. Sets of complex eyes follow you, moving in tandem on either side of the insect's small head. Nothing. Its simple eyes give off no flicker of light. No one is home. The twitches of its limbs are insect-like, unknowable, perhaps without substance even. It's spread too thin among its limbs, performing incomprehensible operations on the world. And you, looking at it, mouth slightly open. You cannot even imagine what it thinks. Okay. There is no change in the insect's motion while it's being aimed by the camera. It remains fixated on you. In three. If it moves, you jump back. I'll shoot. Here we go. Three, two, one. The shrill flash of the camera cuts the air like the blade of a sword. The phasmid freezes in its bright light. Head turned toward the lieutenant. Hypnotized by the flash, it stands frozen before you. I got it. The antennae hang from a great height. With your hand shaking, you barely touch the tip of the left whisker. On contact, the kiting curls into a spiral, like the tip of a poison ivy. Its touch on your fingertip feels cold, ticklish. The sensation is electrifying, resounding through your body. It is surprisingly delicate, the curly end of the whisker, like a young vine. It's even a bit wet. Be careful, detective. It's moving. You were right. It glistens with some kind of moisture. The creature in front of you stays frozen. It tastes like sugar, very faint. The anthropod towers above you, tufts of reeds pointed from limb and head alike. Odorless, mostly comprised of water. The limb before you is incredibly light, like eggshell. It's much lighter than a reed. You feel a soft push could tip the creature over. It's hollow exoskeleton collapsing. Warning. A small shudder passes the creature's arm. High above you, its black pearl eyes still glisten, mesmerized by the light passing its nervous system. Here, within the smooth white inner part of its limb, you sense something very intimate. Thoughts. The nervous system could be spread out like that, over the extremities, like a cuttlefish. Another shudder pulses through the creature's limbs. It jolts back to life, like a record continuing where it left off, in a swaying, praying motion. Even the small black pearls of its eyes do not stray from you. Nothing. Its simple eyes give off no flicker of light, no one is home. The twitches of its limbs are insect-like, unknowable, perhaps without substance even. Mute, the insect foams from its mouth parts, tilting the plates of its fused together head from left to right, without reason. As you back off, the phasmid also takes a step back into the reeds. Something tells you the next time you engage and disengage, it will probably flee. The arthropod follows you with its antennae. As you back off, the cracks and hisses of the tape that's come to its end grow more distant. Hissing and clicking, the arthropod extends its mandible-like antennae to greet you again. You're right below it, looking up 
at the colossal chitin of its white limbs. Its small eyes look at nothing in particular. As you're turning away, the phasmid mirrors your movements, stepping on the water, the long limbs carrying its feather weight without breaking its surface. And just like that, it's gone, skating away across the sea's calm mirror like a skipping stone, leaving nothing but circles on the water. And something under it, in the place it stood, bobbing there, among the reeds, a collection of items. It's gone. Apparently, yes, like a water strider. Only, I've never seen anything like that in my life. Looks like a nest of some sort. We should have a look. What now? Our suspect is not looking so good. We need to check on him. What is it? What do you want from me? I can't go. Something is very wrong with him now. See? Mr. Dallas? The man does not respond. He keeps staring, black eyes glazed over and bulging from their sockets, his gap-toothed mouth shaking like an addict of some terrible substance. The plastic cape feels coarse. A light shiver passes the man. Other than that, no reaction. He feels small and frail. He's going into some kind of psychomotor immobility. The good news is, this solves our transportation problem. Doesn't it, Mr. Dross? The trembling mouth appears to sigh. Between this and the broken tire he's used for a boat, I think it's safe to leave him here, while we go and get help. It will need to be medical first, I'm afraid. Old age and shock. The appearance of the Fasmid in conjunction with the stress of the arrest. He spent his entire life here. For him to leave would be... He stares into the reeds. Your words don't stir anything in him. Perhaps you should. Nothing. Just dull staring. Not even rage left, wherever he is. The last embers have gone out. The war is over. If Kuno kicked it into the sea, as he said he did, the ebb would put it back here. This makes sense. Mr. Dross could have picked it up. Or the Phasmid even. If it did, this is incredible. I... I lost. He turns his eyes to the reeds again, as he's done so many times. Beige and white stripes. He lost the scope. Then it somehow made its way over there. With the help of a magpie phasmid. This sight is a T9, Mr. Dross. Was it attached to the rifle when you made the shot? Silence. Not even a sigh. The plastic cape flaps around his face in a gust of wind. His back is slouched and his mouth open. The blacks of his eyes are receding. His pupils are returning to normal. 
We should think about getting back to the mainland, to get help. He'll be safe here, if we don't take too long. The skiff is swaying on the waves by the dock. Let's. We are done here. The skiff rocks gently under your weight as you get in. The ride back is uneventful and quiet. But for the sound of conversation on the water, there is someone inland waiting for you. Two men and a woman stand on the concrete square of a nameless village, looking at a small yellow boat as it draws closer. The sea is calm. You reach the jetty and climb out of the skiff. Look what the tide brought in. You look like a fucking clown, Harry. Not like a funny police officer, but like a real-life, full-time, pie-in-the-face, unicycle-riding circus employee. Bothered by it? Harry, you're a goddamn cop. They're afraid of you. Yes, that has always explained it. Vic, calm down. Hello, I'm Trent Heilerstrom. I believe we've met on several occasions. I'm your goddamn partner, Jean-Vic And this is your special task force. Or what's left of it. Special Consultant Trant Heidelstam, Patrol Officer Judith Minot. Hi. We've come to scrape what's left of you off the pavement. Lieutenant Kim Kisoragi, Prison 57. We've just come from the island where our investigation led us. We might need your help with something later. As if he recalled that he's in fact a decorated police lieutenant and not a naughty boy. But this is clearly a departmental matter, so I'm going to leave you to discuss it among yourselves. It's good to meet you, Lieutenant Kitsuhagi. Letting the lieutenant know he shouldn't feel embarrassed over the shitstorm that's about to befall you. Ari, we want to help you. Trant, I believe this is where you come in? Um... I don't quite know what I'm doing here. I was asked to participate as an expert. I think I need to manage your expectations a little. I'm at best an enthusiast in cognitive science. My background is in something else entirely. I engage in neurology on a merely theoretical level. In fact, I should probably get going. No, Trant. It's too late. You're part of this shit now. What have you got to say for yourself, shit kid? What does he have to say for himself? He left you to catch the bullets. The cafeteria manager you fucked over told us where you went. Shit kid. He didn't betray you. He just told us the direction you went in. Who's Sylvie? Strange. He didn't mention that. In fact, the establishment didn't look saved at all. 
there was a giant aerographito in front of the building, mixed with blood. I don't know, it had shit kid written all over it. Guilty as charged. I heard you lost your mind and your memory. I wanted to see if it was true. And it was. Good work, Harry. You're insane now. There's one less person for me and everyone else to rely on. Did you? Or did you literally not recognize my face? We've been partners for how long, Harry? Don't answer that. You don't remember. No, my name is not Oz-Faced Woman. It's Judith Mino. I was assigned to your unit two months ago. I thought we were friends. Okay, because you're my commanding officer, I... I really want to respect you. I want us to have a normal relationship. That will never happen, Jude. He's the rudest man on Earth. He's the reason why the rest of us have to take sensitivity training. And I hate sensitivity training. Yes, I'm Tran Heilerstam. I never said I wasn't Tran Heilerstam. Mikael? Mikael is my son. No, I was just interested in the Feld building and the Martinez beachhead. And Mikael wanted to see Martinez. It was a coincidence. What indeed? I was asked to share my take on some of the more obscure theories developed in Königstein in the 30s. Like partial psychotraumatic amnesia, group personality theory... He's here to see if you're insane. He's smart. Let's move on. Duped? Hey, here's a brilliant idea. Don't be a morbid drunk and you won't be duped so easily. Yes, I'm still Kim Kisuragi, still a lieutenant from Prison 57. Still caught up in this crossfire, too. Yeah, major crimes unit under Lieutenant Dubois and Vicomar. Ring any bells? Refresh your memory? It's a goddamn major crimes unit. There's you, me, Jude, Trunt fucking Heidelstam, and Guillaume Bevy. I'm technically just a civilian advisor. Fuck you. You're part of this shit show. Oh, that's an interesting story, actually. Guillaume Bevy is a police reporter who joined our team. He was really good. Then he left, because he lost faith in your ability to lead the unit. Other people have left too. Good, smart people. People we won't get back. Only me and this really patient petrol officer are still here. And Trump, because I'm forcing him to stay. Do? It's a major crimes unit. We clear the desk of cases so Precinct 41 doesn't look like the worst station in town. We're shit here now, Harry. Because of you. The 41st isn't... God damn it, Harry. You told us to fuck off. You said we are cramping your style. You're a detective god. Fuck everything. All will burn. Detect or die. It wasn't like that. Fuck you, Harry. We didn't know there was gonna be a tribunal, did we? Oh, you think it was cool? You saying that? Aesthetic somehow? You were crying when we got here. Breaking things. You said we were going into the abyss. None of us wanted to see the abyss, so we fucked off. Like you told us to. The bells aren't ringing because you have brain damage. Trant, this is where you come in. How bad is it? Well, he doesn't have visible tremors. He talks without slurring. He can drive a boat. He's standing, reasoning. All good signs, but... Complete retrograde amnesia, episodic and semantic. As displayed in the station call, our interactions with him, and I don't want to be a snitch, but also mine with him before when Harry did not seem to know who I was. It's all very interesting. Interesting? 
Yes, interesting. I have my theories, but I would like to hear Harry's thoughts first. Harry, what do you think happened to you? Neurologically, psychologically, and why not socioeconomically? Not when you phrase it like that, but I don't think critical theory. I know everyone thinks this is far-fetched pink academia, but still, I don't think it should be off the table here. What? He lost his memory because of capitalism? No, not like that. I'm not talking Vredefort's cool here. But Harry, I asked you, what do you think happened? He is. He's getting better. And I can confirm that he drank a lot of alcohol prior to it happening. I believe he drank. People do that, especially this one. What they don't do is forget their whole life because of drinking. But Detective Vigmer, he has blanked out before. Yes, a couple of times. After some of the more serious benders. One was after the two drunks case, the other when we looked into that mural. The two cases in your ledger, the unsolvable case and the new world mural. Those were recent. Those cases were hard on you. Interesting. So at first he dipped his toes into it, prepared. That's where he would have gotten the idea, yes. Practice. And then he used alcohol to get there, so to speak. What do you mean? Well, here is my theory. What if this is an absolutely normal reaction to the world we're living in? What if this is not a significant anomaly at all? Something to be explained, approached as a defect. Look at the sensory input here. Look at the ruins, the neon. Listen to the radio, the multitudes, the people. Live here for 40 years. As a police detective, he's like a magnetic reader on the world team, to borrow a known metaphor. Harry's been pushed flat against it. Total input. Hardwired to the free market. He just needed for its end. Okay, Trump, thank you. That's absolutely meaningless. I'm glad we brought you. Will he or will he not be able to work in the major crimes unit? Is he a cretin now? I want to know that. He's not a cretin, and he is able to do work. If not in his previous leadership role, then as a line detective. For now, I misphrased my question. It should have been, is he able to put his clothes on and use the potty, or do we need to get him on a disability pension? Now, nothing. Now we're just going to stand here. No, now we discuss that. What the fuck did you do to our motor carriage? Why is it there, Harry? Jacob Irv? I know who Jacob Irv is. I wanted to give you a chance to stop fucking me. How naive of me. You drove a 45,000 real police vehicle into the ocean. What did I expect? <sighs> it doesn't matter. Your badge, Harry. Show me your badge. We're not armor cops. We're cop cops. People don't know us by your armor. They know us by your badges. You called in and said you lost yours. Have you found it? He squints at it, suspiciously. Okay, and your gun? Yeah, gun. The thing that was given to you to kill people. Upgraded it? I don't care about your weapon mania, Harry. I only care about your official sidearm, which you lost. I don't care. Where is the gun the RCM gave you to kill people with? Where is that one? Phew, he has it. I thought it was in the ocean. You drank like a bum, Harry. Put that thing away before you kill someone. Well, you let the suspect escape. Glacier something. Because you were too drunk to assess a flight risk. 
We've read the reports. Lieutenant Kitsuhagis. We know. Oh, well. If she was specially trained. I'm not even gonna get into the other suspect. The one who shot herself in the head. Or the fact that you're Evart Claire's little peony now, doing I don't know what for him. That's small time stuff. That's nothing. That's a humorous anecdote. Compared to the seven people who were gunned down, the streets are literally red with blood, Harry. It was fucking mass murder. He did everything he could. We did everything we could. The company hired and vetted mercenaries. Lieutenant Dubois could between them and the locals. Here comes the cavalry. He did so at considerable risk to his person. Remember, he was shot. We stopped an execution, not a negotiation. The loss of life was minimal compared to what it could have been. Don't make this harder for yourself. Thank you for the input, Lieutenant Kitsuragi. I didn't mean to suggest you didn't handle the situation. You spent the week with him on this case. What is your take? On um, the case? On Lieutenant Euphretor Dubois. Well, the drinking, the last gun, also losing his badge, that's all true. And he's been drinking on the job. <sighs> then there's the boring cop issue. Despite all the obvious and almost grotesque mannerisms and sartorial choices, he still insists he isn't characteristic enough. It's... it's worrying, especially considering his political views. Detective Dubois is, as you may know, a Mazovian socio-economist. He wants to liquidate the ruling class, which, again, for a police officer, is a little odd. Other still, he is also an ultra-liberal hustler who is always on the grind. How he reconciles these two points of view, I do not know. But he is vocal about both of them. And then there's the motor carriage in the sea, and the constant smoking everywhere, all the time. But despite all this, he is a great detective. One of the best I have seen, in fact. He can talk human beings into telling him anything, and he doesn't stop. In all the time I've spent with him, he has not once stopped working on the case. He is tireless, madly driven. Well, except that one time when he stopped to sing karaoke, which, by the way, was a valiant effort. He really sang his heart out. Yeah, it was what it was. Other than that one time, he has tirelessly worked on the case, and he solved it. We have a confession, a murder weapon, and the perpetrator, locked on the island right now, awaiting transportation. He apprehended a straggler who stayed hidden for 50 years, ever since the revolution, who's probably committed other murders over those years. Oh, and he also discovered a new species. A new species? A colossal stick insect. It was on the island, camouflaged as a reed. It unfolded from the reeds. I think we may be dealing with the Insulindian Phasmid. He takes out the photo and shows it to the officers across the yard. Rain comes down. He covers the glossy photo of the Phasmid with his hand. You hear gasps beneath the howling of the wind. As you can see, it's about three meters tall. In fact, we think it may be the largest land invertebrate ever discovered. What fucking hell is that? Is this somehow connected to the case? The killer did not seem to be aware of the Phasmid's presence, exhibiting a strange, atypical dementia. He fell into a stupor after its appearance. He became near catatonic. So it is connected. I must say this is absolutely extraordinary. It's... I don't even have words for it. Yes, it really does make it hard to fire the drunk. Yes, yes. Fallen through a gap in the boardwalk. Drunk. The body was transported to Precinct 41, our morgue. I had Tilbrook and Mullins take care of funeral arrangements and uh, family stuff. You're not the only cop in the world, Harry. 
This all comes back to us. Still, good work with the missing person, detective. It's still a point for you. No denying it. Female? What makes you think so? You had to see it. It had the subdued colors of a female. And the nesting behavior too, I think. Incredible! Were there eggs in the nest? Not as far as I could see. There were other things there, though. Actually, you know, this would indicate it was a male. This is far from anything in my field, but I think such nests are called bowers. They are for attracting mates. It must be robust if it can move a helmet with its limbs. It could make me roll it, like a dung beetle. Like the cephalopods? Phasmids, I think, only have nerves in their heads and abdomens, though. There is a correlation between invertebrate size and intelligence. Was it...? No, I wouldn't say it was... Uh... At that size, this creature would have a lot of surface area to put neurons into. It's basic geometry. Yes, but also reed-colored, beige and brown, a little green on the outside. After unfolding from a single stalk, it still retained parts that looked like reed tufts on its limbs. Incredible. The PR value of this is exceptional. Carp discovers new species. Maybe even discovers the Insulindian phasmid. No, no, that's too much. This would really help with some of the uh, problems we've been having. Absolutely, this is great. This does not say vigilante murderers to me at all. This is science, news, human interest. You know, it's a really good thing you have that photo. Without it, you're doing good here. Perhaps only for a moment, but still. Quit while you're ahead, or no. Lilianovich. Revolutionary matronym. The custom started in Grad, where they have patronyms, Prasovich, Larsovich, etc. The revolutionaries saw this as a chauvinist atavism, so they used matronyms, derived from the mother's name instead. This man's mother was Lillian, his Lillian's son, Lilianovich. The custom was overturned after the revolution failed, but not before it made it to Revachov. So, it is what a soldier of the ICM would be called. Thank you, Trout. Thank you for that piece of cultural theory. You said you have a motive? Of course, excuse me, I just thought it was noteworthy. Jealousy? I thought this Lilianovich was an old man. To have been hiding for 50 years, 70-something? A strange psychosexual fascination. The result of spending all this time in solitude, on the islands of this bay, and trauma too. He himself gave a political reason. In his mind, he had killed an enemy combatant. Also, we have ballistics from the gun, matching the bullet found in the dead mercenary's head, and two officers on the scene that Mr. Dross confessed to. It's a clean win. Perfect folding mechanism. Get over yourself, Harry. I can still smell the booze on the wind. God damn it. It is bad. Even you can smell it. Chin up. Keep focusing on the positives here. I don't want to, but you discovered a new species and solved the murder. So I have to. Jude? Honestly? Anything that ends this trial is okay with me. Agreed. The public relations potential of this is too valuable to let go. Okay. We have vehicles in the square, and the perpetrator needs to be taken into custody. Let's go. The man looks westward, impatiently, jingling his car keys in his pocket. Who is Lena? Tabernacle? It's on the way over. Near where you live on Perdition. Fine. If we're gonna drop you off anyway. 
She and her husband were conducting the search for the Fasmid. It's their discovery, in part. They should know as soon as possible. It would do you good to deliver some positive news for a change. Who are you? You're a gym teacher, Harry. Well, obviously you're not a gym teacher anymore, but... Before you were a cop, you were a gym teacher in Coran. It's getting really cold outside. Should we maybe... No, a regular one. Harry, it explains everything. The running around, the jumping, the shot put, your inexplicable facial hair. Some of your more <clears throat> old school wording choices, your posture even, the constant stretches. And this guy too. God, even this javelin throwing freak here. In your 20s or late 20s, you've really let yourself go since then. Yes, you tell Jim in Courant. I believe that's the term. Tell Jim at a high school. You were a high school gym teacher. The smell of sweat and glue. The worn floorboards. High school. Harry, your goings on with Kuno, Andre, Asel, the whole thing on the ice. That's why you are so juvie. The regular. You found some chick. She inspired you to fight the big fight. Be more than you are. All that. You. Every morning, walking from Voyager Road to teach Jim. She. Leaving for the academy with her spring coat on. The air filled with the smell of smoke and raspberries. And incredible hope. An ocean full of hope. I knew it. I knew no normal human being can run like that. He's an honest-to-God gym teacher. It's not a mystery. Some chick fucked you over. Also, you were drunk. You really went with it too. Really maximized the damage. Dora something. Dora Ingerlund? Yeah, you mentioned her name. Not Dora Dubois. Something like that. Afvazan. No one is married anymore. This is Revachol. God, I don't know. Six years ago? She was way before my time. Six years and you haven't gotten over it? What the hell is wrong with you? No, it was six. Like, ancient. It's an old man thing. Two old years equals one normal year. That and Dora Ingerlund really tore you a new one. A big one. Incredibly bangable? She was extremely fuckable, Harry. Gorgeous. A gorgeous bourgeois woman. Wayfish. Like a Welkin, basically. I've only seen a picture. But it's obvious you formed a real spiritual connection with how pretty she was. One you never recuperated it from. Look. The sun is about to go down. It's time to go home. I think she taught in the Académie des Arts, east of the river. Way east. Hard to say which came first. The middle class chick or the drink. Egg and the chicken kind of thing. My point is, you need to see a psychiatrist about this shit. Not a psychologist. Several degrees harder. Is there something harder than a psychiatrist? A forensic psychiatrist? Good talk to that. Us? We're the bloody murder station, haven't you heard? We're the bad guys, no one likes us. That's not true. Jamrock is too big for one precinct. You're just understaffed, and everyone respects the 41st. You have Captain Price. Thank you, Lieutenant. You're being kind. It is an understaffed station, and the district is too big, which is why we need to. Get back to it. We left Torson and McLean to run the sea wing. It's not good. Mac the Torso Torson and Chester McLean. They're not fit to run away. Believe me. Things are shaky as it is. God. There are four wings, Harry. A, B, C, and D. We're in C. It's made of losers and clock punchers. You and I reconceptualized it as a task force. It was a mistake. There's also a lot of outside help involved. Not only me. Other losers too. Ptolemy Price? 
He's the son of the old Price, one of the founders of the RCM. He's one of the most highly regarded men in the Force. You're lucky. Somewhere under the curved roof of a former silk factory, shaped like a ladybird with two chimneys, Police Captain Ptolemy Price sits behind a heavy wooden desk. Resident medic Nix Gottlieb pours him coffee. It's silent in the captain's office. They speak of change, the city, the tension on the streets. They speak of the events of April and the blood on the streets in May. Okay, it's not the bloody murder station. It's an old converted silk mill with green desk lamps and coffee corner. A lot of good people work there, hard, every day. Jamrock is the largest ghetto in Rivershall. Faubourg, technically, but uh, it's divided into 11 districts. Jamrock only as us. The press will blow over. Jamrock is lucky to have you, and it's often considered to be the greatest of the districts. You're lucky to have him. Thank you again, Lieutenant. Well, first I will go back to my station and write the most detailed report anyone has ever seen. It will have to be good to cover all these. Then I will have a serious talk with my captain. Detective, we just stopped a small-scale war. Something is happening to Revachol. I don't know what yet, but it's going to be a hard spring for the RCM. We need to get ready, infiltrate, investigate. Talk to Captain Price? I'd rather not ruffle the feathers of two captains with my doom-mongering. Work with... Price? I'm flattered, but I don't know if I... Would fit him. And crazy enough. Can take the stress. He doesn't know how to finish the sentence. Flattered? You're Lieutenant no Kitsuragi. We would be flattered if you even considered. I would have to tie things up in GRIH first. But, I mean, whatever is coming, Jamrock will be more central to it than the harbor. And we also have a huge caseload, Lutnant. Piles that we need to get back to. Mountains, even. I do like the sound of that. Good. Fuck it. Let's go. Tron brought his motor carriage. It's a 20-minute drive to Jamrock. The great district hums in the falling rain. A chessboard of wooden houses, 80,000 living souls, fire traps as far as the eye can see. From Main Street to Grand Courant, from Precinct 41 to Boogie Street, forking into the rain-swept horizon. You close your eyes and hear the dogs bark. A lone woman sits by a factory window, dreaming of meteorite strikes. On Rue de saint jerome a square bullet slides into a square-shaped chamber. In Old South, a man without eyelids smiles. Spring has come. It's time. Dawson? Yes. McLean? Yes. Heidelstam? No. Lickmere? Yes. Dubois? Of course. Really? Nick Scott Lee looks up from the list. I hear he's unstable. You say that like it's a bad thing. Captain Potomney Price gestures with a ballpoint pen. It's dim in his office, and the curtains are drawn. Harry's our man. He'll pull through. When he does, he'll side with the people. Understood. Gottlieb returns to the list. Minna? Of course. Wonderful. Then can we please just go back to Jamrock now?